Good afternoon. I'm Greg Hart, Chair of the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors. This press conference is broadcasting on County TV Channel 20 and the county's YouTube page. The meeting is being interpreted in American Sign Language by Kim Rich. Carlos Saraceto is interpreting this press conference in Spanish. This interpretation will be available on the county's website and YouTube page shortly after we conclude this press conference. A lot has changed in the past few weeks. It's a relief to finally be able to share some very good news. Santa Barbara County's new positive COVID-19 cases, the testing positivity rate, and local hospitalizations have all significantly dropped over the past three weeks. The technical problems with data from the California Department of Public Health have also now been resolved to the satisfaction of our public health department. We can finally say the declining numbers we were hoping to see are real and substantial. All of the hard work we have been doing together as a community to reduce the spread of the virus is working. This is a well-deserved moment to acknowledge this very important achievement and also recognize that this is not the time to get complacent. At the July 24th press conference, Dr. Anzorg inspired us by suggesting we should try as a community to cut our positive COVID-19 cases in half by the end of August. That seemed at the time a very ambitious goal. The path to achieving that goal was through each of us reducing our activities, wearing masks, maintaining physical distancing, and washing our hands. These simple steps are very powerful when we all do our part together. As Dr. Andrug said back in late July, if we successfully achieve that first goal of reducing our cases in half and continue to reduce cases going forward, we would also put our position, our county in position to reopen our schools and more businesses. Today, I'm very pleased to report that we have surpassed that ambitious goal with another week to go in August. On July 24th, there were 133 new positive COVID-19 cases reported. The past seven days, we have averaged 61 cases per day. From late July, when the state data system began to fail until this past Monday, we did not have access to reliable information about local cases. Fortunately, now that we once again have accurate data, we can clearly see during that same time our COVID-19 cases were declining significantly in almost all areas of the county. COVID-19 cases in the city of Santa Maria over the past two weeks decreased 39%. The city of Lompoc saw a 35% decline and cases in the city of Santa Barbara dropped 30%. Our testing positivity rate has also mirrored, mirrored the decreasing positive COVID-19 cases. Santa Barbara County's test positivity rate is now below the state 8% target. Dr. Joe Reynoso will have all the local case test positivity and hospitalization numbers in her report. While Santa Barbara County continues to remain on the state monitoring list for the percentage of cases per 100,000 residents, the path to get entirely off the state monitoring list is clearly before us. This week, San Diego and Santa Cruz counties achieved that important milestone and are now able to open all their K through 12 schools per the state guidelines. Orange County is also very close to getting off the state monitoring list in the next few days. These counties, like our own, must continue to take steps to keep community transmission low or run the risk of backtracking on the progress achieved. I know it has been tough to remain committed to working together to slow the spread of the virus, but I am so very proud of what we are accomplishing together. I want to again commend every member of this extraordinary community who is taking personal responsibility to protect others. There is more work to be done, but we have proven once again that we are up to this task and we will succeed. On Tuesday, the Board of Supervisors will consider adopting an ur urgency ordinance that will create additional administrative enforcement tools to enforce public health orders. This does not represent a change in the enforcement approach the county has taken which is to encourage compliance through education and encouragement because as you can see from our declining numbers, this course has been very effective. Earlier this week, California experienced an unprecedented 11,000 strikes that caused 367 wildfires. As these wildfires have raged largely out of control around the state, our local air quality is deteriorating and becoming a health concern. Projections for potentially worsening air quality this weekend require us to caution local residents. 
Please stay home as much as possible. Protect your lungs from unhealthful air. N95 masks are the only face coverings that protect against the fine particles and smoke. These masks remain in short supply and are needed by healthcare workers for treating COVID-19 patients. The Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District posts real-time air quality information for all the communities in Santa Barbara County on its website. The Air Pollution Control District website also has very practical how-to information about creating an indoor air filter that can reduce harmful particles inside your home. It's very simple to construct using a home attic filter taped to a fan. Visit sbcapcd.org to get up-to-date information about our local air quality and safety tips to protect you and your loved ones from smoke in the air. Next, we have Dr. Vonda Reynoso, Director of the County's Public Health Department. Thank you, Supervisor Hart. I'd like to begin my update today by thanking those who have been diligent in wearing your face covering when you leave your home. It has been uncomfortable to wear one during this hot weather, but you have remained steadfast in protecting others by wearing yours. As a county, we are seeing the benefit of adhering to the health officer orders and working together, which has resulted in a decline in our case rate. Schools with TK through sixth grade have the option now to return to in-person learning if their, wa if their waiver application is approved. However, we cannot let up on our efforts. Instead, we need to increase our efforts since we still have widespread transmission in some areas of our county. Today, we are reporting 81 new cases. Currently, we have 254 cases that are still infectious in our community. Currently, 54 people are hospitalized with 20 in the ICU. Our total case count stands at 7,653 today. Again, we must act to decrease disease transmission, which will ultimately allow the state to remove us from the county monitoring list. And in order to, for that to happen, we are required to have 100 cases or less per 100,000 people. We currently stand at 138.7 cases per 100,000. In addition, our case positivity rate needs to be below 8%. Our current case positivity rate over seven day period stands at 7.2%. I'm very pleased to report that these numbers recently show that we have been trending downwards. Again, however, we still have a lot more work to do to get off the state monitoring list. Earlier this week, I reported to the Board of Supervisors that one of our communities, Idle Vista, is seeing a dramatic increase in cases. In order to address the increasing numbers, I'd like to share to you today what the community is doing. The county, UCSB, and Isla Vista Community Services District are working with residents and community organizations together to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Extensive social media outreach is taking place, educating young people about the importance of practicing physical distancing, avoid social gatherings, and wearing face coverings while in public. Face coverings are being distributed at various locations in the community. Many Isla Vista businesses have expanded their seating areas into the public right away, creating space for people to practice social distancing, physical distancing while out in public. Isla Vista residents are being encouraged to speak with their roommates about how they can keep their household safe and what they will do if someone they live with starts to feel ill. Additionally, UCSB and community providers are increasing access to mental wellness support, understanding the need for young people to take care of their mental health. Also, to continue this downward trajectory, I wanna share that there are current plans being made to limit activities on beaches in Santa Barbara County during the Labor Day weekend. Similar to the closure on 4th of July, 
Beaches will be closed to stationary activities in order to minimize gatherings. More information about this will be available next week. We're taking these actions really to limit crowds and gatherings, and they, these actions will contribute to the decrease in disease transmission in our community. Finally, I'd like to give a quick update on CalReady and our local efforts. CalReady, as you know, is the state's disease investigation database and for three weeks was severely backlogged. Our local epidemiology team have been hard at work to reconcile the backlogged cases. We have been in contact with the state epidemiology team to make sure that all the cases attributable to Santa Barbara have been properly accounted for. We have received their codes and methodology and were able to validate the data. With that, we are confident that as of this week, our case numbers, case rates, positivity rates as published on our website reflects our current status. Please note though, that there will always be differences between our website and the information on the various state data dashboards due to lag in reporting dates and times. In closing, thank you for doing your part to keep our community safe. Everyone benefits when you wear your face covering, when you maintain physical distance, when you stay home when feeling sick, when you avoid crowds, and when your weekend activities do not include gatherings with people from outside your household. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Darnosa. Dr. Henning Anzorg, the county's public health officer, is also here with us today to talk in greater detail about the case through six school waiver process. Thank you, Supervisor Hart. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to report that we are seeing a downward trend in county cases over the past two weeks. This is a reflection of a reduced rate of virus transmission. We are attributing this welcome trend to the community's efforts and cooperation with masking, social distancing, general hygiene measures. We are now in a position to accept waiver applications from elementary schools to be allowed to open for in-person instruction. We are definitely on the right path and we urge everyone to continue with their efforts in order to reduce the virus spread even more and get to a point where all schools can open more safely, more businesses can operate, and our lives can get closer to a new normal state of affairs. In order to reach this point, we need the younger generation to be diligent in following the health orders, to wear a mask, social distance, and avoid gatherings. Across the state and country, we are seeing a very concerning development of more coronavirus infections and hospitalizations in the younger age groups. Admittedly, more frequently than in older folks, younger people, when getting infected, are more likely to experience a milder case or even remain asymptomatic. This, however, poses a particular risk because asymptomatic carriers may spread the virus widely when traveling or mingling with others and not adhering to protective measures of keeping a distance and wearing a mask. In fact, what I'm hearing from our local infectious disease specialists is that over 40% of all hospitalizations in the county currently are of people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. COVID is definitely no longer a disease of just old people. At this crucial point in our countywide COVID response, we want to appeal particularly to our younger people. Please cooperate. Understand that young age does not protect you from possibly experiencing a very severe case of COVID if infected, and you will contribute to extensive viral spread, even as an asymptomatic carrier. Thank you for, thank you for your cooperation. Thank you, Dr. Anzer. Next, we'll go to questions from the room. Mr. Devine. Yes, just uh, following up with that, uh, Dr. Ensorg. So you said 40, over 40% 40 of people hospitalized are in their 20s and 30s, or did you say 20s, 30s, and 40s, yes. 40s, okay. Thank you. Um, just another question I have. Um, could you go into a little bit of greater detail about that application process for in-person school reopening 
uh, when will that application be available? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to. Uh, the application form is being posted as we speak on our website, and it's going out per email to all uh, school boards in the county, and um, it's, it's a, a fairly extensive application, uh, requires um, quite a bit of input from the schools, but uh, it's outlined in the application process very clearly. If a school were to fill out the application tonight, how soon could we see them doing in-person learning? Yeah, the, the, the earliest uh, possibility for um, school opening is two weeks after receipt of the complete application form. The reason for that is that we have to verify all the information and we have to actually get it validated by uh, the state health department and get their okay as well. And then um, thus far, what have the questions been about uh, this application? How many schools have reached out since you announced this on Tuesday, I believe? You know, I'm not sure. Um, uh, we have a school liaison um, at the county who is in contact with um, uh, different school districts. And what I've heard from her is that there is great interest in not just in private schools, but also in the public schools. Thank you. I'll just go into... Dr. Uh, Reynoso, just explaining the, uh, I believe it was 138.7 cases per 100,000. If you could clarify that a little bit, wh where we need to be and where we're at. Sure, so uh, we, it's been incremental. So until recently, we were well in the 300s cases per 100,000. So the state's uh, ideal is for us to be below 100 and the gold standard would be um, around 25 cases and that's not feasible so we are at 138 today and in order for us to open additional schools we have to be below 100 uh, cases and so when we talk about uh, doable achievable goals uh, earlier, we had said that when we were, uh, we wanted to uh, reduce our cases by half in August, and we were able to do that. And so that's where we stand. We are down, downward trending, and I am really hopeful that as a community, we can work together to continue that um, so that we are well below 100. Lastly, for me, with the Isla Vista and uptick in cases, um, why do you think this is, given the fact that school is obviously remote for UCSB? Is it just a lot of students moving back in and mingling off campus? Or? Yes, so we are uh, noting that there are more students coming back, even though the most of the education is online. Uh, so with the students coming back, occupying high density living situations, and uh, there are more movement, more social gatherings. Um, as a matter of fact, we have uh, several staff who are looking for housing in Isla Vista, and they are sharing with us that exact experience where they are um, answering ads that say come to live in and experience the dorm like uh, setting without being in the dorms or come and enjoy a college experience not being in college or we don't believe in COVID-19 exists come and be free so a lot of those I think sentiments um, can produce uh, gatherings and lack of adherence to face covering physical distancing, and avoidance of, of crowds and gatherings. Based on that, how do you plan on enforcing Isla Vista differently than other parts of the community? So as I shared, um, the community are coming together and are doing a lot of education. And, and we do believe, based on uh, published uh, studies, that really effective change happens through peer and peer education. So with the... Uh, with our own Ethan, uh, doing a lot of social media engagement with a lot of other young people committed to that, with UCSB being very um, aggressive in their outreach efforts, I believe that we will see a decrease um, in two weeks to three weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Devine. We'll next go to questions on the phone. 
Yes, first up is Josh Molina with Newshawk to be followed by Nick Welsh at the Santa Barbara Independent. Go ahead, Josh. Thank you. We have a elementary school in Isla Vista and I wondered, is, will that play any factor at all if the Goleta Union School District applies for elementary schools to open? The fact that you have a rising number of cases in IV next to an elementary school, is, it, is the application that nuanced or can you address that? I'm happy to know um, the, the numbers, the metrics that we apply uh, for, for allowing a waiver is countywide and it's not that granular. So um, Isla Vista Elementary School is more than welcome to apply. Okay, even though they're in a hotbed of rising cases. Uh, that is correct, yes. Okay, um, and also, uh, you mentioned elementary schools can apply for the waiver. What about the uh, secondary uh, school districts? Is that going to be a possibility as well at some point? No, uh, the state um, allowed for transitional kindergarten through sixth grade. Okay. All right, and then also, you know, we've been in this position before where the cases uh, dropped and people were uh, pretty optimistic and positive. And so I'm wondering what what is being done differently this time or what lessons were learned from where we were at in say May. Uh, it, it, I understand that there's gonna be a lot more education and outreach and that sort of thing, but uh, how can you guarantee as much as possible that you can do that, that we're not gonna be back in a similar situation in a month or two? I think it's a really good question, and, and it has to do with the context. If you remember the first time, um, as you described it, we were in the same position. It was coming out of the complete shutdown that was imposed by the governor's order. And then as he opened up the dimmer switch and, and allowed more businesses to open, we saw cases rise. And all of that precedes the extensive use of masks in the community. There was no order at the time. Um, requiring that since those events that is the current status and and people are wearing masks to an increasing degree um, all the time and that's I think exactly why we have seen the cases decline over the past three weeks is that the compliance with the mask orders has dramatically increased people understand the importance of this and are committing to that and doing the right thing so we're in a very different situation now um, than we were in May Okay, uh, no more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Molina. Next up, we're going to Nick Welsh with Santa Barbara Independent. Hi, I was hoping uh, it's kind of a two-parter. Um, first, the numbers in Santa Maria are pretty dramatic. The drop there, 39%. Um, first, I'm interested in what specifically do you think made that happen? What were you doing differently or what were you doing better or what was the secret sauce that made that happen? And then if you could amplify a little bit more, what when you say more social media, more outreach um, in Isla Vista, paint me a, a clearer picture of that. How do you combat, uh, you know, ads that say we don't believe in COVID-19 come be free uh, with social media? Um. With Santa Maria, we can correlate the intentional increase in partnering with various community groups to do not only the outreach, but to also test and to also provide isolation and quarantine uh, support um, and partnering with the city for code enforcement, education and, and actions. I believe that those um, confluence of, of partnership, of intentional strategies, uh, produce the, the downward dramatic decrease in cases in Santa Maria. I am confident that if we use the same uh, method, the same strategy of partnering up with uh, community-based organizations in the community, trusted leaders, uh, providing the messaging, providing the face coverings, and providing the education 
um, as well as the isolation and quarantine support services, uh, we will produce a similar downward trend. Okay, and, you know, when you talk about quarantine and support services, how many rooms do we have at this point available for people who need uh, quarantine? Um, I don't have the exact numbers um, uh, available to me right now, but I can tell you that when I looked at it on Monday, we still had empty rooms available. So we offer isolation and quarantine services, uh, supportive services to those who can't safely isolate or quarantine at home. And we have been able to provide those individuals with the needed services, and we still have capacity, both in North County and South County. The last question, going to Isla Vista, how many people will be involved in this effort to try to uh, keep that one from getting out of control? I mean, how many from the university, how many from the county? I don't have the exact number count of participants in the movement, but I can tell you that it is the county um, uh, led by Supervisor Hartman, uh, Supervisor Hart, um, their staff, uh, public health, uh, UCSB is involved, uh, the Isla Vista Community Services District, and a number of residents and community organizations. Okay, thank if, you very much. If you'd like to participate, we'd love to include you. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you. Next up, we're going to Risa Georgie with San Inez Valley Star. Hi, everybody. Um, this is for Dr. Ansorg. Um, you and I had talked earlier about the waiver process, and um, you had suggested or had said that uh, part of this the teachers or staff for the schools who apply for this waiver will have to be uh, regularly tested. Uh, what does that look like? Um, how often is that going to be happening? And how is the county going to support the public schools and the private schools uh, with doing that in contact tracing? Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Risa. The, the idea, uh, just similar to nursing homes, is that the adults, so the staff, the teachers, but also everybody who works at a school, need, we need to make sure that they don't carry the virus into the school. And therefore, the guidance from the state is to have all staff members tested every two months. It can be on a rotational basis, like uh, half the staff every month, for instance, to get an idea. This is under circumstances where there is not an outbreak at a school. This is just routine screening to make sure that we pick up uh, incidental you know, positives early without them getting, bring the virus into the school. So, and um, we had very long discussions with our leadership team and our lab team, how we can support the schools. We understand that it's a big, undertaking for a school, a nursing home might be a little bit better equipped to uh, do a testing like that. And we have created a very substantial list of uh, local labs, commercial labs, uh, services where we are going to support. We also have our uh, regional, our county testing sites in place that are available for our teachers as well. Uh, we consider teachers uh, as essential workers, so very similar to firefighters and nurses and doctors and um, um, first responders. So we will support the schools in uh, making this happen. Um, as far as more support, like in the contract tracing wise and talking with some of our sending as local school districts, they're concerned that they're gonna be spending a lot of time of contact tracing if they do get um, a, a positive from either a staff or a student. So how how is the county going to support that role? Yes, the schools will have to teach um, staff members to, um, to become really good at contact 
uh, tracing to be able to collaborate with public health. And we have set up, uh, in conjunction with uh, a county education office, a webinar that is held for all, school, uh, for all public schools on August 8th. And it will be followed up shortly after for all private schools, where we give very detailed instructions on how to do this. And um, um, we, we have worked with the school nurses in the past on uh, other outbreaks like influenza or pertussis or measles and so forth. And um, we will continue to work with the schools very closely. And since we are close um, or close-ish to being under the uh, monitoring list or off the monitoring list, um, if that were to happen, let's say in, in September, um, if we were to come off the list, would that mandate all the schools reopen fully from K to TK to 12? That would be the requirement for letting all schools open. That is right. And they would not have to go through the waiver process. The waiver process is only in place currently that we are not off the monitoring list. And um, however, um, schools that want to open for in-person already know that they have to comply with regulations from the state health department with regard to cleaning and regular testing and so forth. Thank you, Raisa. Next up, we're going to Fabiola Navarrete with Tu Tiempo Digital. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Okay, my first question uh, is, um, can, can a person who already had COVID-19 be infected again? Most likely not. Uh, there is not a single case known in the literature so far. Okay. Uh, we heard from the C CDC that said that this can be possible and we just want to know, I know you said it's not mm, very common, but it is possible. What are the chances of that? The chances are close to zero. The reason for that, okay. uh, why we cannot be more definitive or the CDC is not um, being more definitive is because the, nat the disease is so young. We've only had our first case here in, in early April. So it takes time to, to understand okay how some individuals may respond to the virus, but so far in the United States, there has not been a single case of proven reinfection. Okay, thank you. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Fabiola, and that concludes our question session. Thank you for those questions. Next Tuesday, the Board of Supervisors will again receive a briefing on COVID-19. This meeting is broadcast live on Channel 20 and is always available on the county's website. Our next press conference will be a week from today on Friday, August 28th at 4.30 p.m. If you have any questions, please dial 211. The county has transitioned the county call service to the 211 service. Uh, the 211 information line will be able to provide customized local information for our county and direct uh, access to services and support. The 211 line is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week and is accessible using multiple languages. Please continue to practice these three simple personal steps every day. Number one, remember to wear a face covering and stay at least six feet away from other people. Number two, wash your hands thoroughly and often. Don't touch your face and disinfect surfaces. <clears throat> Number three, if you feel sick, stay home. Don't go to work and isolate yourself. Call your doctor or clinic and follow their medical advice. Thank you for joining us today. Please be kind, considerate, and patient in your interactions with others. We are making excellent progress in the local fight against the coronavirus, which demonstrates we will get through this together. Thank you.